Thanks, Rosie. Thank you all for coming us uh, here this afternoon, and thank all of you for logging on virtually. Um, now, of course, some would say the subject of today is actually prejudice, right? And prejudice existed, existed in many forms throughout centuries and has been with us for a long time. And there can be no com more common a prejudice or more common a, um, a discrepancy than in, in the gender space. And we know that to be a fact. Um, some people might, might argue that it doesn't exist, but I think the patriarchy in many parts of the world does exist. So, in spite of what we have in front of us, with gender and uh, diverse, um, gender disparity and all kinds of prejudices, we've got both of you at the top of your game. Irene, we've talked before on air. Sherry, your uh, rumour has it, legend has it, that you are, that the incoming Prime Minister of Singapore is a fan of yours. He apparently has lunch with you. Irene, you are moving this behemoth from the old world to the new world, and you sit at the top of, of your pyramids. So maybe we start with Sherry and, and tell me, um, what in your life and your experiences has, has brought you to this point in your career? First, uh, I want to say I'm super inspired by your speech. So thank you for driving that movement. And, uh, you know, I, I felt that this talk is even more critical once when I saw the word 168 years to close the gender diversity here in Asia. Uh, so I, I think in response to that, uh, what took me here, uh, I would basically say I'm very fortunate to grow in a society and environment where we look at meritocracy because I came from a really, really poor family and uh, basically would have no chance of succeeding in a society if not for the fact that, you know, it offers education for f pretty much free you know, to any kid around the world, I mean, in, in, in our country. Uh, so I went through an uh, education route, but we all know that even with all the good education that a country can provide, you do need support and help. And I was also very fortunate to have a good support system from the people around me. Um, and I always tell uh, women out there and pretty much everyone out there, there are actually a lot of good-hearted people who really wants to help. Uh, and, and I was maybe one of those who will put up my hand, I need free, free tuition, I need support, I need help, I need money to buy you know, school bags and stuff like that. So uh, Singapore is a meritocratic society and I graduated from school with literally no help from the family, uh, but just good people around. And uh, I got into my, uh, my first, fortunately, I went through stringent interviews and got into Lucent Technologies as my first, um, you know, uh, job out of school. And uh, it is an international, it's a multinational company. Uh, I work right, I, I graduated with a marketing degree, but I write, I walk right into tech. And in that environment, one of the things that I realized is that there's nothing too difficult to learn. So I am just ferociously sucking in kind of like information from a tech perspective. So in that environment, I learned networks, radio state, radio signals, you know, designing of uh, telecommunications from the devices to signals to system. Uh, so yeah, it's that continuous learning mindset and that uh, willingness to just do everything that I, you know, I'm, I'm a, a person when I'm told, please jump, I'm like, how high can I go? Can I break the new limits in that sense? Yeah, um, so obviously the, the media uh, has covered you for many years. Uh, the public record has, has, has your story out there. Um, your, your background is one of quite um, extreme circumstances. I think some, adversi some extent of adversity in there. I'll let you share that with us today, Sherry, uh, without me you know, uh, talking about it, to the extent that you are willing to do that. Okay? And Irene, what about yourself? Um, okay, so I was brought up in, with, with three brothers. Uh, so I always wanted to beat the boys for some reason. <laughs> um, and then I went to a girls' school, um, and I think I was a little bit lucky in that sense that the girls' schools I went to, they encouraged ladies to be the best that they could be and nurture the talent that you may have and so forth, really. So um, I think I was just lucky that I was surrounded by the right kind of people to encourage me to be who I am. And I think the first thing that comes to mine is 
myself as an individual, as opposed to I am a female first, or uh, my gender comes to play first at, at, in my mindset. So it's really important um, when you do your job or when you go into a meeting, um, it's about who you are on how you can contribute and beat the expectation. It's all about beating the expectation, really. So, um, so yeah, I think when you do that and everything just falls into place and you'll be surprised at the many opportunities that comes and presents itself to you and people will listen to your work or your voice as opposed to seeing you as a, gen as a female person first. So what did Tony and Sia knew to, f to see fit <laughs> that you should head the team in Malaysia rather than him. And we know he's quite a, an egoistic char character. <laughs> yes. um, maybe it's that, that, that challenge that I take, like I want to beat his expectation. He always tells me to do something with just one sentence. I'm like, okay, this is really difficult. How do I do my work when <laughs> someone tells you in one sentence or so? So then what I'll do is like, okay, I'm going to like surprise him and just do, give an option A, B, C, D. Um, and he probably doesn't know what he wants in the first place, right? So at least it gives you the opportunity to say, okay, maybe this is what you're thinking. And they go, oh yeah, okay, then let's develop on that. So perhaps um, the fact that I take challenges and um, I have an open mind um, and, um, you know, and I try to... Um, develop things and create things um, and get things done and ex execute it as how it should be. Yeah, and clearly Tony likes that, right? He likes to be challenged. Because um, I'm a guy. I, I think I'm a guy. Uh, last I checked, I am a guy. And I, I guess it's appropriate that I should be talking to two, you know, two, two women uh, about such a subject because I might come from the other side, right? Um, and so one of the seminal tomes um, that, that um, talks about uh, trying to equalize the gap is has the well, came from Sheryl Sandberg, right? She 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 joined Facebook um, quite famously um, to to fill in the parts that Zuckerberg could not, and uh, she she wrote a book called Lean In, right? And Lean In talks about how you know um, females in the corporate world have to basically play the play the part and to participate more. Like boys, you know, boys are very vocal; they talk a big talk and they don't always back it up with substance, like shall we say, right? Um, so, so there's a part that women have to play to, to stand up and be counted because it, historically, and we know as, as a cultural you know, pool, we don't really do that. I mean, you know, Asian females are, well, they, they tend to take a, a back seat, right? And I just want to talk about how when we walked into this hall, um, you know, I, I just walked in front of everybody, right? And both of you walked in the row behind because, you know, uh, did, did you notice that? I was like, that's interesting, right? So, so to be a little bit off, off the limelight, if you like. So, so, so what, what kind of, what kind of diff change in mindset should, should women adopt to maybe say, hey, I'm here, I've, I'm, you know, count me, you know, look at me, right? How can women change in that respect? Sherry? Wow. <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I, I did not realize, so thanks for calling that out. Um, I, I think by nature, there is reality in the biological makeup for female and male. Uh, I think let's start with that, right? We all recognize that there is the difference. Uh, two is, I think um, it's very natural for women to kind of like think, uh, oh, let me be the supporter, let me be the supportive role. Uh, even if uh, I recall in my career, I used to write, every speech that my boss uh, kind of like deliver and, and probably have to kind of like coach and say that, hey, you got to say this, this is how you say that. Uh, but as I'm always admired, you know, he could take that speech who he knows nothing about and stand on stage and do such a good job, right? Present as so wow, he's the expert. And then I look like, hey, you, got, you don't know what. So I think it's a natural um, tendency of women to have that sense of supportive role. 
and um, uh, uh, that lack of confidence. So uh, lately I've been telling that we do need to help each other, women lift women by giving one opportunity for that you know, stage uh, to, it's to inspire more confidence about how you deliver and how you tell the story. But I do think that women are amazing, you know, storytellers because we move a lot to your point uh, from the heart. Uh, you know, which is, I think, our ad, besides EQ, CQ, LQ, I think we have a lot of love quotient uh, that drives a lot of what we do. So it's about uh, movement in the community of inspiring confidence and also helping. I think one of the big things I always know is that do not uh, be afraid to go out there and ask for a coach, ask for support. Uh, there'll be a lot of people who are willing to help. Do you think it starts in the family? You know, because, um, you know, especially Asian families, right? The parents, you know, the fathers, the mothers tell the girls or the sons, say, you know, boys, you do this, girls, you do that. And, I mean, as a culture as well, you know, um, th there is a lot of that um, impediment in, in terms of our, our faiths, in terms of the way Asians are. There's hierarchies as well. And hierarchies are both forces of good and, and forces for evil. How do we address these issues in an elegant way, Irene? Yeah, I think you're right. Parents play a big role, in, especially in your formative years. I remember last time we have to do household chores. My job is to uh, help with the dinner and lay out the table and then wash the dishes. And then I will ask my mom, how come my brother is not doing this? <laughs> Why is he doing the easy one? Why is he hanging out clothes only? <laughs> or something of that sort, basically, right? So. And then um, there was a, there's always a great debate on, on, on that, basically, with my brother. So I think my parents just left it with me and my brothers to handle how to be fair with the household chores, if, if that's how I feel. So I guess it's, yeah, it's, it's true. The parents play a role, and then teachers also play uh, an important role in school. Um, and, um, and that creates an environment that will encourage that individual to be the best that they can be, right? To see what are the many possibilities and having an open mindset and so forth. Um, because otherwise, if the parents say, okay, girls, you only need to be a flight attendant or <laughs> um, a teacher or maybe marketing at best, um, I don't think that would be great, right? Because then the, the girl, when they, when they grow up or when they graduate, they only choose what they think is appropriate for them as opposed to try to explore software engineering or computer science or maybe um, aviation, um, aerospace and so forth. Yeah, so, so that's important. And th when you're the formative years and the people around you and the environment around you. So at a familiar level, definitely uh, more can be done and more, more has been done increasingly, right? But then, but then the individual takes on the baton, right? And then carries on in his or her career. And then, and then nature takes its, you know, then nature comes into the game because your physiology demands that uh, your body is made for certain roles. And, you know, obviously childbirth is, is, a, is a predominantly female um, um, act, right? So if one wants to have a family, then, then the decision, the hard one has to be made. Obviously, the woman has the child, but then that one or two years, you know, preceding and, and succeeding as well, comes in and then the career path takes a different trajectory, right? How should one deal with that? Oh, I love that. So I, I want to take that because I think I get a lot of this question. Uh, so I have, two, uh, I have two kids. My son is 25. My girl is 20. Does that mean you had a child at 15? <laughs> Oh, let's guess that. Okay, um, and, and um, a lot of um, people has the perspective that, hey, if I'm going to do, and have amazing kid, right? They are like, I would say my son is super, super brilliant and intelligent. Uh, he's a coder, he's a you know, computer science, uh, and, and my girl is celebrated for his, her just mind-blowing 
heart and mind <laughs> and, and intelligence and uh, but I have been working non-stop, you know, from that day. I recall that I delivered my baby on the bed and then I sent an email to my boss and said that, hey, I might be away for a month or two. Um, and, and, and the perspective for me is that women tend to think that, hey, if I'm going to do well at work, uh, at work, I will not be able to do well at home. Uh, but I have a counter perspective. I think I... Women and men equally, I think we can only be a whole person. How healthy you are at home or at work translate into the different various uh, identity and role. Uh, to me, the, the ability to balance comes from your perspective of your healthy self. So you need to work on yourself. And if one is healthy, you will translate it across to be super efficient you know, uh, at work, uh, highly productive. Uh, at home, you can continue to, um, you know, groom and educate and build a close relationship. My kids are very, very close to me. Uh, although I travel non-stop since the day I stepped into my role in Lucent, uh, I've been traveling ar ar around the globe because of the regional role. Uh, and uh, we communicate since like 20 years ago. They've been communicating, you know, remotely with me. I'm interested. I know what they read. You know, I influence them on what I read. So my kid tends to pretty much know what's happening in the market and industry. Ask them, you know, about industry trends, about, you know, society 5.0, industry 4.0. My girl is not technical. She studies law. But she can talk about those stuff because we make it a day-to-day -day exchange and don't limit kids, right, to think that, oh, they're kids. They won't understand. Oh, you'll, you'll be surprised. And yet, Sherry, um, let's be honest with ourselves. Someone like you is an outlier. Mm -hmm. You are a first among equals because... If everybody was like you, everybody would be CEO of Google Cloud Malaysia, uh, Asia, right? But they're not. And, and very few people can be you and Irene because you have reached the top of the games because of who you are and the amount of effort you put in. But not everybody is like that. And for many women, the decision comes to a crossroads and they have to choose a fault, which direction to take. How do you traverse that though, Irene? How do you manage that decision? Does the decision in terms of, um, I'm trying to Career understand the question. Career yeah. or parenthood? Uh, okay. So, so coming back to that question that you had on maternity leave and whether women should feel like they are being left out because unfortunately they get pregnant, or fortunately they get pregnant, right? And then they need to take maternity leave. And this happens um, to me when I was heading up the airline and we, you know, we were the first in the industry in Malaysia to employ female pilots. And this started when we had our cadet program. We encouraged um, girls after school to just enroll in the cadet pilot program. So during my time when I took over from Tony, um, these ladies have gotten married and they, have, um, they become pregnant. And then they come up to me and say, we don't have a, a policy for pregnant ladies for pilots. <laughs> I'm like, oh shoot, <laughs> we have to do something about this, right? How do we do? How, how, you know, I have to work with the civil aviation authorities of Malaysia to allow, you know, w when is it safe for them to fly? And how do we actually compensate for them to get the uh, maternity leave? And they shouldn't be so shy about not having a family because they're so scared that if they don't fly, then they will lose those hours and so forth. And with this, I realized that we shouldn't really just have maternity leave. We should have paternity leave as well because then, then it feels equal, right? And at the same time, also, it's good for the fathers to, uh, to be part of that bonding of the family and so forth. Um, and I don't see any paternity leave um, being in Malaysia as well. And I think that's really important information of that family uh, as well. So... Um, Striking a balance, um, I guess, in a way, is like, what's your priority in life first, right? So, um, for me, it's like, okay, creating a balance in life, I can't have, it's, it's, I think it's a very difficult thing to do, right? So, what's, uh, what's key first? So, if it's work that needs to be focused more, then maybe I have to spend a little bit more at this time, but in the Next time, maybe you need to spend more time with your kid because he's performing in some orchestra or whatsoever. You need to spend more time there. So I think we need to learn how to delegate, 
um, and we need to be confident of delegating. It doesn't mean that you need to prove yourself and therefore you need to take everything in. Um, and that's really key. And I think it's also important to shout out for help within that community, right? Whether it's in your workplace or with your family members or the environment around you, because it's really important to let the employers know this is happening. And then how do we, um, you know, manage that and build a policy around that if, if that needed to be? Yeah, so um, empirically speaking, business and politics for the last century has been dominated by the male, by, 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 by the patriarchy, right? Uh, yes. More arguably than not, right? And, um, you know, we, we've come to a point where we, we can change and we, we, I mean, there are signs that we are moving in a different direction. Um, and obviously diversity, uh, a diverse mix of people makes for a very diverse set of experiences and a diverse set of outcomes, right? So, so what, what does a diverse corporate structure look like where it's not just diverse at a gender level, it's diverse at an age level, it's diverse at a racial level, it's diverse at an experience level, because prejudice has permeated society and business in many, many ways, right? It's not just gender. Gender is just one of many ways that we've been divided by society. What does a diverse corporate world look like in the next century? So I think I can speak a little bit from a... So I was previously looking after... Uh, uh, public sector for Microsoft, for Asia Pacific, and then I'm now with Google. I think one of the interesting things is that it has to be intentional. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot leave it to, hey, uh, there's a famous saying, you do not, you cannot measure, manage what you do not measure. So from a corporate perspective, it starts with that intentionality of, uh, I need to achieve a certain diversity, and you're right, it's not just about you know, a gender, it's a whole spectrum of diversity. Do we provide uh, opportunity uh, for different types of uh, contribution by different types of people? Uh, so I, I can speak a little bit more like at Google, uh, our mission is to serve everyone, right? If you want to serve and be able to design products and solutions that meets everyone's requirement, then you need that diversity. So from us, it's a business imperative that we bring in and you have to build it from a board measurement perspective on various different types of diversity targets and then uh, enforce it to ensure that leadership understands the value and the purpose and the impact of diversity. Two is it has to be uh, not just oh, let, let's create an environment of diverse uh, gender and you know, uh, uh, culture and stuff like that. But the environment needs to be able to support that diversity. Uh, so you have to put in education. Unfortunately, we all need to be educated. You know, what does diversity mean? And what are uh, when how you show up, how you move around, how you react to people's ideas and statements, sometimes there's so much unconscious bias. And we need to be kind of like modified and trained uh, to understand and how to behave, to create the environment and culture where diversity can thrive. Um, and, and then last, I would say it's um, uh, not so much from a corporate perspective, but uh, uh, we need leaders, we need voices like, you know, uh, Yuki-san, where you are actually out there coming from the top, intentionally looking. I was just uh, having, you know, a few conversations with a couple of my friends, and um, in the last few weeks, you know, just like yourself, I facilitated many panels, and coincidentally, it is very male-dominated. And uh, I ha had conversations with uh, some of those uh, uh, senior leaders, and I was just looking through, and True enough, the board actually, because it starts from leadership, in my opinion, and a lot of the board are still very, very much uh, male-dominated, but unless there is a movement that creates that need and creates that awareness that, hey, we got to bring diversity from that perspective, um, I think it's going to be a, a cycle that is going to be tough to break, like what you saw, right, 168 years. Most of us would not, our earth would not survive that long <laughs> at the rate we go. <laughs> the, the problem with that is that the, the troublesome aspect of that, Sherry, has been that value has really been driven by profits and outcomes in the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. uh, victory at all costs, right? You win a war or you lose the war. You make money or you don't lose or you don't make money, right? And value, the concept of value has to change over the next hundred years, right? And that's why I guess the last hundred years 
has been dominated by the patriarchy um, and manned by individuals with a highly disagree disagreeable personality, which is what type A males can be like, right? Um, so for the markets to change, for the concepts of value to change, people have to change, markets have to change, business has to change, right? Uh, I mean, that transition might take longer than expected though, don't you think? Um, maybe not, maybe yes, but I don't know, sometimes you just got to disrupt yourself to make it happen. Um, you don't wait for gradual change. Uh, sometimes it's just about like, let's get this done in two weeks as opposed to two years. Um, or so, so it just depend on how important you feel uh, that topic is, and how how you want to make it that happen, and you want to execute it well, uh, basically. Can, can I just uh, add to that, right? I think uh, you are absolutely right. We cannot break the patriarchy. It is so ingrained in every part of society. It's ingrained in culture. It's ingrained on every aspect of our being unconscious even. Uh, but I would say to everybody out there, it's a very interesting momentum right now in the world that's happening. I would say from a technology angle, we're standing in that cusp of something very substantial shifting. We're talking about Web 3.0, we're talking about uh, Industry 4.0 accelerating at you know amazing speed. We're talking about even entering to an environment of society 5.0. You can keep naming different types of phenomenal but I think we have an opportunity right now to make substantial shift. I would say from three perspectives. Number one, technology now empowers. Uh, in the past, because of how generations before it set up, women have very little opportunity to engage and you know, uh, step into STEM, uh, uh, STEM uh, uh, in that sense. But today, technology enables. Go to YouTube, you can learn pretty much everything that you want to, uh, to learn. Uh, and some of, when you take that initiative, you'll be very, very surprised. Uh, for example, us at Google Cloud, we're like, there's Google Career Certificate. You may know nothing about data analytics or AI, but if you go through those courses, you have an opportunity to pivot. And also, the society today needs those talent. You know, uh, it's very much competency based. The second perspective beyond technology is culture. We're standing in a very different type of society where people are not as accepting of what's been passed down. Look at talk to my kids, right? You tell them, do this, they're like, why? Why do I have to do it? So people are beginning to question, you know, what's been established, so it is an opportunity to make change. But to your point, we got to be good storyteller. We got to be inspiring that change, or else nothing is gonna happen. Uh, uh, then to your point about profit, right? I would think that uh, because of the shift in technology in the world and how this whole breakdown of digital and geographical divide, right? Because Digital makes it possible for everything to break boundaries from a geographical perspective. So businesses and uh, uh, institutions has opportunity like never before. You're never going to be just a Malaysian or a Singaporean company or a business because with digital, you can reach the world market. So with that, diversity and ability to bring in different types of talent becomes so critical to business and to profit. Yeah, expecting the eradication of prejudice is just... From, from an organic, natural level, is as troublesome and as difficult as uh, getting people to change their environmental habits and, and, and climate change to happen. It's got to be legislated. Otherwise, it's never going to happen, right? Which is why we've got these ratios in place and we've got COP27 happening in Egypt in a few days. Um, I want to bring it to, to your experience, Sherry, because um, you had an all-female leadership team in Google Cloud, Southeast Asia, right? So what kind of outcomes are you seeing there? Um, that are giving real value to Google uh, sh stakeholders. And I think, I think we move that to Irene as well. I mean, in terms of how you're you know, moving this pendulum forward in, in your position. Sherry, Google Cloud? Well, I, I do not hate it off. You know, <laughs> just to, I'm privileged to be part of a pretty uh, 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 all-female leadership team from a go-to-market perspective, headed by Rama, my uh, boss. Um, so I would say that I don't know if it's by coincidence. <laughs> I don't think it's intentional by design uh, because I think our policy, is, to Irene's perspective, is we look for individuals who can 
do the job uh, and the competency that a person brings. I don't think it's by design that, okay, let's go out there and hunt for women. Although, uh, you know, uh, intent, I think uh, coincidentally, uh, 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 myself, uh, April, Mago, and Malice, and uh, Rama brings to bear a, a deep technical expertise uh, that serves, uh, you know, the market well and also uh, reach market networks from our years of engaging uh, go-to-market uh, strategies uh, for tech company. So I don't think, uh, is, has that made a substantial change? Uh, I think we love working uh, with each other. <laughs> we enjoy, uh, given that, um, uh, Google is a, a, a amazing place to work uh, where it allows for that diversity, it allows for that respect. Uh, uh, when we are engaging in conversations, you will see that tone of respect about uh, each other's opinion and giving space. You know, it's never about, okay, I want these resources, I want this campaign, I want this and that. It's always about giving space to each other and supporting it. It's a very supportive culture. I am quite fortunate to be part of. So if you're saying about that 30%, um, we're getting there in that sense. Um, it's really because we're looking for individuals that could contribute um, to what we're doing, uh, as opposed to finding a female first or so. But I think it's hard to find, really, because not a lot of females are very good at shouting out about themselves. They're not good at you know, beating their chest and say, hey, I am this, 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 I can do this, 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 this. Um, and also, they're not very relatively less good at networking than men. So that's also very important, right? Because I do see ladies, after they finish working, they just go straight to home, and that's it, where else, you know, most men, they go somewhere and drinking or, or do something else together or something of that sort. So I think we need to work harder at networking and telling the whole world what we're really capable of. And, um, and also, um, you know, that we are also as good as men to be on the board, really, because I think we, I can see how some of the board members are searching for ladies, but they can't seem to find the right ones. But I, and I keep giving them names. Uh, but I, it, it's also because women are not out there to, to, to actually advertise themselves <laughs> in that manner. Uh, and that needs to change. And when it comes to senior management or so, I mean, we're, we're pretty good in that sense that we encourage ladies to be senior managers. And I think really because we are, you know, we are we based on meritocracy. So if you're good at what you do, whether you're male or female, then you can just move forward and grow with the company. But it's also important to equip ladies with the right tools too and not use gender as an excuse for them to move forward because I have seen some ladies saying that, oh, I'm not being promoted because I think I'm a lady or something of that sort. But to me, I think it's really because you're probably not, um, you don't have enough knowledge yet to be in that position and therefore we need to groom you and so forth. So I think women who use this as an excuse should really th rethink about what they say because then it backfires the whole movement of encouraging uh, women you know, to take higher position and, and so forth, really. So it's the job of the corporates to equip them the right tools. Um, we have the academy at Air Asia also where we encourage ladies um, to become data analysts or software engineers and so forth. And we have a special campaign for the nation for that too, because we do notice there's a huge gender gap um, in this tech positions like software engineering, data scientists, cybersecurity, cloud infrastructure experts, and so forth. Um, and we need to narrow that gap really, because ladies kind of like feel they're probably good as lawyers or finance or marketers, and there's a lot of ladies in that field now. I think in our finance department, it's probably all ladies <laughs> or so. So so we need to make that effort um, starting from school itself um, as well. But at, at an individual level though, um, women have to change at an inherent level because you're asking girls to, to do things which don't come naturally to them. I mean, boys are full of hot air. We're very loud, uh, lacking in substance most of the time. Uh, but we don't mind walking in the front. It doesn't matter what people think. You know, that's, that's what guys do. And after exams, we just say, oh, we did really well and we fail. But the girls say, oh, we fail, but you all get A's. Uh, 
I mean, that's the way we are, right? That's how we're born. You're asking girls to, not, to become what they're not. And that's inherently difficult, isn't it? How, how do we change? How do we alter our makeup? Oh, wow. Uh, how do we change history? Wow. <laughs> that's a, uh, I, I think to me, um, uh, like I said earlier, there is a biological makeup that is there. That is also, I, I don't think it's a problem with the boys. The boys should keep doing what they're doing. It's pretty good. <laughs> but from a, from a lady's perspective, I think a few things, you're right, needs to change, right? I, I do absolutely, I mean, your scenario is a classic one. I hope it's not recorded. My son's like, mom, don't worry. I'm good in this, you know. And then he turns out with, uh, you know, I, I think I'm going to get 98. He will come back with 68. <laughs> and my girl is like, oh, it's so tough, you know. I don't think I'm going to make it. But she will turn up with like 102, <laughs> you know, in that sense. So it's a very natural uh, phenomenon that we see. But I would say I think women needs to work on it. Uh, a few things, maybe. I don't know how much time we have, but I really want to say that one, uh, recognize that confidence is a beauty. Confidence is very attractive. We need to work on our own self-confidence and it comes from a healthy, healthy self-esteem. Uh, it comes from a continuous appetite to learn. Um, I, I know there's a lot of uh, women who say that, oh, this is not me. Um, you know, I'm not like that. But unfortunately, if you want to do certain roles, you want to, you know, thrive in certain capacity, you need to, you need to open your, have an open mindset to learn. And the beauty of technology today allows you to acquire those skill sets. Two is, I think women needs to help women. And thank you for wonderful male a uh, allies like yourself. I, I mean, I'm very blessed to be always in an environment where I have very supportive male allies who are, you know, respectful, who provides the platform. But women in general needs to lift women, right? Uh, needs to be supportive and create that platform and opportunity and amazing leadership like Irene, you know, it's doing that in the market by creating the platform, giving them the opportunities and the stage. Um, and then I don't know how do how do we uh, uh, generationally change. It is going to take a wave. It's going to take generation and a wave. As but it needs to start from all of us who hears the message. I guess. Well, maybe it's happening already, right? Because um, okay, so whether you like uh, like him or not, or whether you agree agree with him or not, you know the clinical psychologist Jordan Peterson. He's divided the world uh, down the middle. Uh, but one of the things he says is that at a general level. Um, women are more drawn to uh, more empathetic jobs, more human jobs like you know nurses and um, hospital health healthcare and education things like that, and men are more drawn to objects right the things stuff right engineering technology and that's why you see this divide among the, gen the industries, but thankfully or weirdly uh, industry is moving in new ways. Uh, Web 3.0 as you talk about Shireen, in the future we might not have a physical self we might be in the metaverse interacting with each other with different forms, right? Um, you know, and what you guys are doing, are doing at Super App, it's, it's, you're breaking new ground that a lot of people don't even realize. Um, the metaverse is a strange and interesting wild, wild world, right? So, so maybe you can you know, cast your mind into the future and, and tell us the, the changing face of, 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 of jobs, the changing face of industry, how, how they're evolving in new and weird and wonderful ways. In other words, spill the beans, I Irene. How, how are you guys going to do it? How are you going to move from airlines to the metaverse? Oh boy, I think, to be honest, Superb is, um, what do you say, it's, it's, it's passe. <laughs> the future is like whatever you go into, it actually knows what you need and what you want, and you don't have to go through a whole f list of icons to get to what you want. It already knows your diary, you can make recommendations if you want to go on a holiday, uh, which flight to take, um, what food to take, um, knows your touch points and your behavior and so forth, that it's, it's just seamless. You could just activate your voice, you would have your own Jarvis, like in Iron Man, um, and that's what we hope Super App to be at some point, right? Just say, um, book me a flight to Bali, and it goes through your calendar and says, this is the right flight for you and timing. And on the way there, this is probably what you need. And you need to come back on whatever date so, so that for, for you to be in time for a certain event that happens at your hometown and that kind of thing, basically. Um, 
I mean, we're also open to cryptocurrency, right? I mean, loyalty points is another way, it's a form of tokenization that could happen in many forms. And we have a huge membership of loyalty points, about 25 million members in the region. You look at the whole point system, there's, I think, 3 trillion or 6 trillion points in this region, actually, where people don't know what to do. So... <laughs> Job, I mean, yeah. sort of the new jobs of the future. New jobs of the future. Data analysts, <laughs> software engineers, <laughs> um, yeah, all those things that we're building talent for, product, UI, UX, designers. Do you want to add anything, Cherie? <laughs> Uh, I think that uh, I, I'm very excited about the future and uh, from coming from a tech perspective, just to answer that question, uh, to me, I think the future of tech is going to be uh, digital. Like I said, right, it breaks down the geographical boundaries that today pretty much, you know, we through COVID, we learn how you can break those boundaries. Uh, but the future of uh, digital is very exciting. You can call it metaverse or multiverse or whichever verse, right? The, 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 easy, under, the easy perspective is basically an ability. Uh, it's really not an imaginary, like a gaming world. It, it, you know, that would not be sustainable. That would not have skill. But it's going to be an environment where the same Sherry has an ability to transition different, um, different environments, uh, but maintain the same identity uh, in a secure manner and have an opportunity to transfer values. And it could be digital currency, it could be you know, tokenization, it could be pretty much different thing. We don't know. It's up to all of you to say that here, because I think the future is in the making. Uh, of course, Irene talks about data. Data is going to be everything, right? Data is going to inform decision, it's going to create exper transform experience, uh, it's going to create opportunity for monetization. But I think uh, if you ask me, what is the future job going to be? I think the future is in the making and it's a hands on everyone. It is an opportunity today where uh, innovators have tremendous opportunity. It's your imagination. So I really think that the startup economy is going to play a very critical role in shaping the new world. Uh, this is an opportunity for creativity to really be unleashed and create new opportunity, new businesses. I don't think there's going to be a chief digital officer or chief you know, technology officer because everything is going to be digital, everything is going to be technology. You don't need a finance manager in the, in the future to be managing your 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 money uh, AI can do that yeah. uh, it is it's yet to be told but I think it's in the making of all our hands here so so maybe I should rephrase my question I'm going to put this question to you Shireen because I asked you how the new jobs of the future will look like in fact what I should ask you instead is what kind of people will succeed the most in the jobs of the future because the jobs of the past to get to the top of the corporate ladder you've got to be highly disagreeable got to be sometimes volatile very loud very abrasive, highly driven, ability to take a lot of pain, work 18-hour days, all days of the week, and be completely driven and focused. And that's typically a male. I just described the male, right? Because they're, they're mad that way. But in the job of the future, what kind of individuals will succeed the best? Um, I think it's really important that you have multiple skill sets because things... Um, so at least you could be... Uh, you be a master of many fields, which I think is really important. Um, and also, you need to be agile. Uh, you need to be able to um, shift uh, and adapt um, as well. So, to me, those are two really important things. And have an open mind, which is really important as well. You, to be honest, you don't need to work 24-7. Um, you just need to find ways on how to optimize the use of hours to give the best results? Uh, so I would think that, you know, in the past, we look at a system of education that produced people with certificates. I would say the future skill sets, uh, uh, the industry is looking for competency, not so much, you know, that what type of skill sets? Can, do you have data analytics skill sets? We don't care if you come from, you know, whichever school or, uh, or qualification in that sense. Uh, uh, because there was a bias that qualification 
defines your competency, but I think the world is becoming to accept that that's not true. Uh, and so it's a competency-based environment. Two, is it's a highly collaborative environment because we are talking about um, the, the kind of diversity and culture that needs to uh, drive business growth. Uh, it's an environment where you don't know it all, you don't have it all. You need to learn how do you bring different skill sets uh, and, and, and honor different people with different cultural skill sets and perspective. So it has to be very collaborative. And I think um, it's going to be an environment where, this is my own opinion, by the way, um, uh, I talk about, uh, I think communications is going to be so key. Why? Because uh, human communicates very, you know, Google and Microsoft, we're all about machine learning and natural language processing. What computer can do with computer lingo in that sense? And you know, it's mind blowing there. But I think the new world is going to have an opportunity where machine cannot do what we human being do by moving up the level where we are not applying a school of knowledge or information, but you're coming from a, a wisdom set perspective. You have an ability to see beyond, but not just see, but an ability to communicate so clear and crisp so that you know you emote people to and mobilize and create movement like what you did yeah, you need to be able to tell a story yeah. so it's not just the IQ it's the EQ the SQ and you know all the other emotional in intelligence uh, metrics as well yeah. thank both of you uh, amazing and insights great privilege and uh, thank you once again it's been fantastic <laughs> Sherry Irene thank you all very much for coming thank you.